Hi there. If you know GMAT, you know data sufficiency, such a popular question type that used to intimidate so many people. But that data sufficiency is now different. It has a new face in the GMAT Focus Edition, the new version of the GMAT. It is now beyond numbers. In this video, we will discuss this new version of data sufficiency, DS questions in short, and I'll tell you how you will learn the right skills to be able to ace this question type in this new version of the test. Okay, so let's just start this with a fact. This is something which is absolutely true. The fact says that data sufficiency questions are now part of data insights in GMAT Focus Edition. Now read this fact and based on this, look at these three statements on your screen. Pause the video, read this nice and slow and choose the statement that resonates the most with you, the one that you agree with the most. Done? Now, I'll give you my take on each of these. Some of it will give you more information and some of it will change what you feel right now about these. The first piece is just about GMAT, the data sufficiency questions, just changing its home in the GMAT exam. So, while earlier it was a part of quant, now it is in DI, so no big deal. If this is what you feel, then that's not true at all. It's not just that they have changed the section in which they were placed, they have actually evolved. Now, if you're wondering how, that is what we're going to discuss here. The first big change is that no more questions in the pure context will be asked. For example, there will be no more data sufficiency questions, testing, inequalities, absolute values, or some very heavy deep concept in prime numbers. That's not going to happen. If pure context is out, what remains? What remains is this, the real world context questions. These are the ones that will stay. So essentially, this means that data sufficiency questions are primarily now word problem type questions. And that's not all. Besides these two changes, a new kind of data sufficiency questions have come in. And these are now going to test verbal reasoning skills. Till now, verbal had got nothing to do with this question type with data sufficiency but now it is there here as well. So this is the first big thing that you need to understand. Second, if you had this feeling that now this test, this, this question type is less important because earlier it used to be 40% of all quant, you know, about 12 questions earlier, but now it's just one out of four question types in, you know, in the DI section, which has about 20 questions. So if you estimate it that way, you're like, okay, it has just five, six questions now, so less important. If this is what you feel, again, Again, that's not true. Data sufficiency questions are really, really important. If you are chasing that 90th percentile, that 645 plus score in GMAT Focus Edition, then data sufficiency is important for you, even if the number of DS questions may have halved, but the importance stays as is. Now, you were wondering if that are there any other changes to these data sufficiency questions apart from the two things we've discussed, you know, where they are served and how many there are. Well, not only do you need to understand the approach to solving data sufficiency questions, but you also need to apply both your quant and verbal reasoning skills to solve data sufficiency questions. So it truly has been reformed. It's a beautiful question type. Okay, now that's a lot of talk about data sufficiency questions. In this video, we will limit our discussion to giving you a flavor of the new question types that have been added so that you can start building your skill set to solve such questions with ease. Let's begin. Well, first things first, you have to understand it's the verbal reasoning questions that are really new here. Now, there are two types of these questions. First type is this, where you have pure verbal reasoning questions, and this has nothing from quant. It's just purely what you learn in verbal. The second type is verbal reasoning questions only, but these do require some quant processing. Something from quant is going to come here. Now, to really explain what this difference is, I'm going to show you two of official examples. Here is each type. And first, let's only look at this one, the pure verbal reasoning question, this one. Now, when you see this question, you see it's all words, it's just text. And when you pause and read, you will realize it doesn't have any math, any quant going anywhere. 
But here in this second question, there are numbers here. You have 100 books and then 20% and, you know, 15 books and this and that. You can just see and decide. And that's the difference between the two question types. Again, one tests pure play verbal reasoning. The other adds a layer of quant reasoning. Now, while there are two types of questions, from a skill set standpoint, you need the same base skill set to solve such questions correctly and efficiently. So that's one good news. So now let's just actually talk about these skills that you need, irrespective of which type out of these two you're at. All right, let's go. All right, let's get into our skills here. And the first skill is called owning the data set. Before I talk more about this skill and how to develop the skill, you need to understand what's the need for this skill set. Why do I need to build this? To understand the relevance of this, I will ask you something. I'll ask you to compare the scenarios described in two questions. I'm going to show two official hard questions, data sufficiency. You will see them, pause the video and just compare the scenarios that are there in them. Okay, let me bring those. All right, here we go. Pause the video. Try both of these. Done. I hope you tried. Now, I'm sure you observed that for students who do have good conceptual knowledge of sets, then they would be able to visualize this quant question very easily through this Venn diagram. You have apartments and then there are features, you know, balcony, fireplace. We could very clearly see this on the Venn diagram. So visualizing the entire scene was easy and it became possible through your conceptual knowledge. But when it comes to this verbal question, there is no concept that you have. There's no concept that can help you visualize this situation, which means we don't already have the skill needed. We need to build our skill set to be able to visualize the entire scene when it's not coming from quant, when we don't have any such association. Now, this visualization should be to the extent that we really own the data set. And now I'm going to demonstrate owning the data set through this very example. So if you read this very carefully, it is talking about a couple that's trying to decide whether they will go to the beach the next evening. It's a certain day when they're trying to make this decision. Suppose it's someday, day T, and they're trying to decide for the next evening, which is the T plus one evening. According to the scene described, there are two conditions that must be met for the couple to visit the beach. What is the first condition? That it is sunny without rain. It should not be raining and it should be sunny. Second, it should be the actual weather conditions on the evening of departure. So it's not like I'm seeing this sunny thing one day before or one morning before. It has to be, if you see, this is at the time they plan to go. That's when these conditions should actually be true. And here are our notes representing the same situation. So visualization this time is different. But see how very nicely you can still see everything. Here, the S for me means it's sunny. The R and the cross means it's not raining. And then this is what I'm seeing for the T plus one evening, the real deal that day. Now, if this is not met, then no, I'm not going to the beach. But if this is met, then yes, we are going to the beach. So these are the note-taking abilities that you have to become skilled at. You will never need to refer to the passage again. You know, once you've read it and converted it into your own notes like these, you really own the data set. Now that we own the data set, then to solve the question that has been asked, you need to visualize a solid approach. What do I mean by that? It means that before you look at the statements that come in a DS question, you should have very definite criteria to assess the statements. You should already know what do I need to look for in my statements? What am I really assessing? So for this question, we need to answer this, right? Whether the couple will really go to the beach that evening. Thus, this question you see is a yes no question. That is, the answer could be a definite yes or a definite no, and the statements provide sufficient information if we can arrive at a definite answer. Suppose that a statement helps you get to a sure yes or a sure no, then it's sufficient. But if it gives you a maybe, despite reading the statement, using the information you're getting, yeah, maybe they'll go, maybe they'll not, then the statement is insufficient. Now, we need to know 
what. So understand that we need to know the actual weather tomorrow evening, that evening that they want to go and that too on two accounts. So this clarity I'm getting because I've owned the data set. So we need to know actual weather that evening which evening the evening that they have to they want to go to the uh, the beach and this also we have to know on two accounts one that it is sunny and two that it is not raining so two accounts as in sunny and rainy so this is what you do not want to happen the rain should not happen while the sun should be there it should be sunny and that's it. You see, if we own the data set, we can visualize the framework to assess the statements. Now comes the final skill, which is where you need to execute everything. You need to execute this visualized approach that you just came up with. And this execution needs to be done using the data sufficiency solution framework. Let's actually see this in action. So we know that this is going to be our approach. We need to know the actual weather tomorrow evening, that evening, on on both of these accounts. So I will keep this approach in front of me as I analyze my statements one by one. This is the first statement. It's telling me that it is raining on the morning and in the afternoon of the day of their planned beach outing. Okay, so it is raining. It is giving me actual information for sure. But does it tell me about the actual weather at the time that I'm interested in that evening? No, it talks about the morning, the afternoon, but not the evening, which means statement one alone is insufficient. And so if you look at your statements, you already can reject choices A and D. B, C and E are still left. Now, the same thing I will use, the same approach, and I will try to analyze the second statement. It says the couple always believes that the weather forecast is likely to be accurate. So first of all, they believe in the chances of this forecast being accurate and then this is what they believe. This is not what is guaranteed to happen. While we are interested in, look at the keyword here, the actual weather at the time of departure. I don't care about the trust that they have in weather forecast. That means even this statement is insufficient. So if I come back to my choices here, my second statement is also reject. The choice B is also rejected. And finally, we combine the two statements. Here we go. Now again, combined also, what do I know? I know about morning and afternoon of the day. I know about their belief. That still does not tell me what I was looking for. Actual weather in the evening. So even combined, these statements are insufficient. Choice C is also out. And this leaves me with choice E as the correct answer. So you can see how each of the three skill sets is required to solve such data sufficiency questions accurately and efficiently. Now, one thing you saw here throughout was I was solving this question statement by statement and rejecting choices. For this, you have to know the data sufficiency solution framework. This is something you have to be very clear about. It's a beautiful question type and it requires the application of a robust framework. So the most fundamental skill set required to ace DS questions is mastering the framework in the first place. Now, owing to a very well-defined structure of data sufficiency questions, the process to apply these questions is the same regardless of um, whether the question is a quant question or a verbal question. And this is the entire process in flowchart format. Now, I agree the uh, format does not look very easy. It looks complex and for the right reasons. A GMAT newbie who has not seen a DS question ever before in their life, they will require effort to master the process. And because this mastery is so crucial, we have created a specialized module called DS Foundations in the EGMAT DS course, using which EGMAT students master this process within three hours of dedicated effort. So this is a snapshot of the course. You see how there are concept files, there are assessments, then you improve your proficiency, more assessments, you keep practicing till you get great at it. Before I conclude and summarize all the methods, another point I want to talk about about is a lot of you probably think I'm crazy to call this a beautiful question type looking at all of this complexity but 
wait till you understand the soul of these questions see quant based data sufficiency questions they were good but verbal reasoning based ds questions they truly are a piece of beauty why they challenge us on so many fundamental levels and that helps us build valuable life skills so really really enjoy the process completely immerse yourself in it and you will see how nicely designed they are how much more learning they bring in now these are the things you need to be able to solve these new question types you need to learn how to own the data set as we said learn how to visualize the approach to answer the question do not jump into statements straight away and master the ds solution framework if data sufficiency as a question type the framework is not clear then whatever type there may be you know quant or verbal you will be confused so that has to happen now eg math students build these skills in a progressive manner in a dedicated course which is specialized for data sufficiency questions now watch this video that i'm linking above to learn more about all of this now i'm not going to leave you just yet you have a practice question to solve so try your hand at this official hard verbal reasoning question with a flair of quant be sure to own the data set first for this immerse yourself in the situation think of yourself as the librarian who's talked about in this situation you'll surely have fun and stay tuned for a solution to this question happy learning